all scenarios is is getting uh, getting an awful lot of attention. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I won't be long. I, I just want to. I don't want to say. I don't want to say too much, but I, I just. I want to say a couple of things. I want to. I want to refocus. I basically want to refocus the conversation back to the board. March for life. Well, good morning, friends. Father Frank Pavone here, National Director of Priests for Life, uh, joining you on this Thursday, the 24th of January. And uh, I want to thank all of you who were at the March for Life. Uh, we're still uh, assessing the comments and uh, all of the wonderful uh, inspiration that people got from the different events, especially the events that we were privileged to organize and uh, processing your requests for more material. And uh, just thank you for being there and, and for all that you do uh, for the cause of life. I'm getting ready uh, here at our office uh, uh, today for leaving tomorrow for San Francisco. The Walk for Life West Coast is tomorrow. And uh, we are going to be joining uh, over 50,000 of our fellow citizens uh, there on the West Coast. Uh, they come from all up and down the coast and from some other states as well to walk for life. And uh, one of the differences between the Walk for Life and the March for Life, even though they're both organized for the very same purpose, and that is to stand up for our brothers and sisters in the womb, uh, one of the big differences is, is that the Washington, D.C. March for Life is much more policy focused. And so we have more legislators speaking. And of course, we're there under the shadow of the U.S. Capitol and the U.S. Supreme Court and uh, not far from the, uh, uh, from the White House. Uh, and then we also have uh, the, uh, in the, on the West Coast, the focus is more on the theme of abortion hurts women. And we have the pro-woman theme very, very prominent. We will have our Silent No More gathering just prior to the main rally, and I'll be leading that. And you'll be able to follow these events live right here on, um, on Facebook. Now, uh, many things are being spoken about. I just want to say a word about our friends, uh, the students from the, the Covington group uh, that has been at the center of this controversy uh, that has arisen over these recent days. I just want to make some, some very, very uh, uh, narrowly focused points, but important ones. Uh, but then I also want to acknowledge that there's an awful lot of uh, 
pain and distress out there about what New York State did uh, the day before yesterday. Uh, actually, it was it's today, the 24th. It was just yesterday. It seems like already a week ago. Um, absolutely shameful uh, reproductive health act, as they call it, that these Democrats in New York have passed, as if abortion isn't already widespread enough and extremely out of control enough. They wanted to have more late-term abortions and more people able to perform them. These, these Democrat politicians are obsessed and in love with abortion, baby killing. And they want it to have, and I want to have it later and later in pregnancy, easier and easier to obtain. My fundamental question here, aside from how can you be a public servant if you can't tell the difference between serving the public and killing the public, my other question is, to Governor Cuomo and all these, these Democrat legislators that voted for this, this, uh, this extreme bill, opening up abortion even wider, right up until birth, don't you care about the women who are hurt by this procedure? I mean, you obviously have no care about the babies who are torn apart, but are you completely deaf to the voices of the women, the moms, and not only the moms who have been hurt by abortion, but the dads, the grandparents, the siblings, the aunts and uncles and cousins and friends, all the pain of what we call the shock waves of abortion, are you completely oblivious to that? Don't you dare put yourselves forward as advocates for women and their health. When you close your eyes and turn your head away from the pain of these moms and their whole families, and it's not as if those voices are, are hidden or hard to find. We are amplifying those voices through our Silent No More awareness campaign which gave the testimonies there in Washington, which you can find at silentnomore.com, and which we will give again in San Francisco day after tomorrow at that beautiful Walk for Life West Coast. So I beg with those who have uh, blindly, some blindly and some because of their love affair with the abortion industry, passed this law in New York Open your eyes, your ears, and your heart to the voices of the women who are so wounded by the abortions that they thought would help them. Open your eyes and your minds and your hearts and let the rest of us spread those testimonies. You can find them at abortiontestimonies.com. And now, brothers and sisters, a word about the Covington students. I simply want to say this. I'm wearing this hat for a reason. I didn't start wearing it after the Covington event uh, 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 these, these last few days. I was wearing it beforehand. If you were watching my broadcasts prior to the midterm elections, I was wearing this hat because I'm a patriot. I believe in America. I believe that Amer the principles America was founded on are consistent with the gospel, the unalienable rights bestowed by our Creator of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the fact that this government was founded on an idea and an ideal, not on a geography, not on a, an ethnicity, but rather on principles that attract people from all around the world. I believe in those principles, as so many of you do, as the vast majority of you do. I believe, furthermore, that making America great again is simply another way of saying what we say throughout our history when we talk about preserving liberty, defending life, fighting for freedom. These are all ways of saying the same thing. Brothers and sisters, the Star Spangled Banner has a question at the end of it. Oh, say does that Star Spangled Banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. In other words, are you still fighting for the principles that that flag stands for and that our founders fought and died for? It's the same principles. They are principles that the church embraces, that patriots of every generation embrace, and that make America so great. So brothers and sisters, 
This is a great nation. And one of the aspects of his greatness is the freedom of expression, the freedom of speech. We stand for that. We need to stand for that. And so for me to wear this hat and for me to wear this collar, I have the freedom of expression to wear both. So does anybody else. So do those students. And God bless them for doing so. I want to say to those students, God bless you for, number one, coming to Washington, D.C. for with hundreds of thousands of other people. It was when I was in high school that I first came to the March for Life in Washington. And that spurred my interest in the pro-life movement. That lit the spark. That enabled me to then become a pro-life leader. And God bless you, Covington students, for coming to the March for Life. God bless those who brought you there, who organized the trip. You were in the right place, as were all the other hundreds of thousands of us, in the right place on that day. Because we're standing up for the children who cannot speak for themselves. And God bless you also for wearing these hats, because that shows that you are confident enough to know that both your country and your church should be preserving for you and in fact fanning the flames of your freedom of speech and expression. God bless you for standing up as all of us did at that march. Did we not hear the words of the most pro-life president that we have ever had when it comes to this issue of abortion? Did he not address us? Did he not speak to us? Did he not stand up and say before our eyes and before our ears and before the whole nation and before the world that he would veto any legislation brought to his desk that weakens the pro-life provisions that our elected officials have worked so hard to put into our laws, into, specifically into our spending laws, to keep our hard-earned tax dollars from going to pay for abortions. Our president stood up that day at that March for Life through his video to the crowd and with the vice president there in person and said, I'm going to protect your tax dollars from going to kill babies. Good idea, do you think? God bless you and all of you, not just the students, for not being afraid to express your support for the President of the United States. I proudly express that support. Nothing's going to stop me from expressing that support, and I don't want any anybody uh, stopping you from expressing that support. So my word to you is keep focused on why it is that you came to Washington. Keep focused on why it is that all of us came to Washington. There are children being slaughtered. They were being slaughtered Friday. They, they were slaughtered on Saturday. Some were slaughtered even on Sunday. They're being slaughtered all this week and next week and the week after. It has got to stop. That's why we were there. That's why we'll be there in, in San Francisco day after tomorrow. But I have another word. Those protesters that were there at that Lincoln Memorial. I don't know if any of you are going to hear or see this message. But you've got to open your eyes to abortion too. Whatever other reasons that brought you there, again, you have your freedom of expression as well. But do you realize that there's a holocaust going on? Of little baby boys and girls? And that these students who were there ought to be praised and congratulated for coming to Washington to stand up against that Holocaust. And all the rest of you, no matter what you're protesting about, raise your voices as loud as you want to raise them, but do not close your eyes or your hearts to the tragedy of abortion that those students were there to protest. They should be congratulated as every single last person, young and old alike, who was in Washington to stand up for the unborn. And finally, for all of us, 
You know, I was commenting on another radio program this morning how in this Covington incident, some very, very powerful dynamics, volatile and emotional topics, are all colliding together. We have in our day today a hypersensitivity about racism. It's very wrong. We, I certainly agree 100% with that. But brothers and sisters, it's being used as a battering ram uh, against, uh, by, by a lot of people against anybody who disagrees with them on any topic. Being, throwing the label or hitting the hammer uh, 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 being a racist, it's, 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 it's out of control. So we have this volatile topic of racism, which is being, you know, people being accused of it at the slightest little appearance of it. It's not even that people have to say anything anymore. It's how you turn your head. It's how you squint your eyes. It's how you move your hand. It, 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 I mean, we're, we're all in this, in this glass bubble of, of, of under this microscope where you can't even breathe. You can't even live normally. You can't even have an ordinary conversation without running the risk of somebody saying that something you did or didn't do, or the way you looked, or the way you moved your mouth, or the way you moved your head, or the kind of clothing you wear, is all of a sudden racist. So you have that, that powerful dynamic and abuse, by the way, abuse of the opposition to racism that we all should have. And then secondly, you've got the dynamic of, of, of the, the Trump phenomenon, pro and con, it's a very strong dynamic right now in our country, and obviously people are at different ends of the political spectrum, which they have every right to be. Every right to be. You take the political position in this country that you believe is right. I'm talking about the freedom of, of speech and of expression and of association. But for goodness sake, it doesn't mean that you jump to conclusions about people or that you, you, you exercise rash judgment. So there's the political dynamic. And then there's, of course, the dynamic of the abortion wars and, and, and the volatility of that issue and the pro-life people coming together at this time of year, which is particularly riveted with emotion as we remember the Roe versus Wade decision. So what happened was with, with this particular group of students, and really all of us, we're, we're, we're standing at the center where all of these powerful dynamics and debates are all colliding together. Racism and abortion and pro-Trump and anti-Trump. And symbols are powerful. This hat is powerful. It evoked various comments, pro and con, just among those of you who are here today. But what we have to be careful of, brothers and sisters, is that in the midst of this, I want to warn you about two things, and then I'll conclude. Number one, be careful of rash judgment. How quickly people from the left and from the right jumped upon these students, upon this situation, when it first arose, without even looking at the facts. Let's not rash judge one another. All kinds of people jump uh, uh, on me with all sorts of rash judgments for everything and anything I do and say or wear. Well, we, we, we've got to stop the rash judgment. And then secondly, brothers and sisters, we have to recognize that taking a position on an issue, whether it's abortion, whether it's President Trump, whether it's any particular policy of any particular candidate or party, just taking a position and expressing that position does not by itself make you divisive. This is another word like racism that's being used as a battering ram against anybody that has the courage to speak their mind. We're told we're divisive, we're divisive. Well, guess what? The nation is divided. The nation is divided about various different topics. And you know what? It always has been. In fact, read the Gospels if you want to see an example of divisiveness. See if Jesus Christ isn't divisive. I did not come to bring peace. The Lord Jesus Christ said, but division. 
And he said he would divide a family right down the middle. You've read the gospel, haven't you? Those of you who think that anytime anybody says anything, it's divisive, you're the most divisive of all. Nobody can say anything these days without someone accusing them of racism and someone accusing them of divisiveness and someone accusing them of being political. A priest can't preach the gospel without somebody telling him he's being political. Brothers and sisters, I have a piece of advice for all of you. And it comes from a man who passed away not too long ago that I'm sure many of you would watch regularly on television. Charles Krauthammer. I was saddened, as many were, when, when he passed away some months ago. But you know, in the tributes to his life, I was also very inspired. Because people were recalling that he said, if you don't, and I'm just paraphrasing, but this was his exact thought. If you don't speak your mind clearly and honestly, you have betrayed your whole life. Think about that. If you don't have the freedom, the integrity, to be able to say what's on your mind and to speak freely, brothers and sisters, you've betrayed your whole life. Thank you, Charles Krauthammer, for not only articulating that point, but for living it and giving the example. And I pass that on to you again, brothers and sisters. It's utterly American that we have that robust freedom of speech. As the Supreme Court said in one of its decisions about free speech, our, our discourse in America on politics and on everything else has to be robust. It has to be uninhibited. And you know what? The church believes the same thing. The church believes the same thing, and shame on us if we give any impression otherwise that we are not all, from high school students to the uh, Native Americans and African Americans and priests and all of us together, we have the right to express our mind. And if we don't, we betray ourselves. Brothers and sisters, you want to wear this hat? Wear this hat. You don't want to wear this hat? Then don't. You want to support one candidate or another? Go right ahead. But be ready to engage in the honest process that we have in this country of making our case, of expressing opposition to different ideas, and then expressing our position also in the voting booth. Let's have this process continue in a vigorous, uninhibited way as Christians as Catholics, as students, as clergy, as Americans. Can we pray together? Lord, thank you for this nation. Thank you for the great cause of life. Thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for students who are not afraid to stand up against injustice. Thank you for citizens who are not afraid to express their political views. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom and the courage to speak our minds. And we ask you, Lord, today, set us free from prejudice, set us free from the rash judgment that would so quickly have us turn on one another simply because of something we see or something someone says. Lord, give us open minds, gentle hearts, and free spirits that we may listen more than we speak, that we may allow the other to express what they say and what they mean, that we may have the humility to ask for forgiveness if we misinterpret the words or actions of others, and that they, we may have the strength, indeed, to defend life and to make America great again. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless each and every one of you, Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Frank Pavone here of Priests for Life.